Only arts. Mr. Speaker, I'm obliged to you. The Honourable Member for St. Joseph. Mr. Speaker, it has fallen on me uh, to do the proverbial wrap-up of this debate. And um, this honour has rested on my shoulders because I am to announce to the Chamber that the Honourable Prime Minister has this evening journeyed to Washington, Washington, D.C., uh, to meet with Madame Lagarde, the President of the IMF. And with her is a delegation comprising Ambassador Masco, uh, the Governor of the Central Bank, the Director of Finance, Mr. Ian Carrington, and um, I think that's that's the extent of the I think that's the extent of the delegation, uh, Mr. Speaker. These meetings with Madame Lagarde will carry on the work and will seek to further the work that has been commenced over the last few weeks by an extraordinarily hard-working team of Barbados Labour Party front benchers, a team of senior civil servants, and the best financial advice that Barbados could afford, all of which combined, sir, to ensure that Barbados trods correctly and sure-footedly out of the abyss that we have found ourselves in after 10 years of Democratic Labour Party rule. Mr. Speaker, having indicated though that the Prime Minister is now away dealing with important and urgent government matters, I'd like to further begin by expressing my personal gratitude to the members of the constituency of St. Joseph, but also, sir, to the entire electorate of Barbados who have seen it fit to put their confidence in a Barbados Labour Party administration in an absolutely overwhelming way. No political party in the history of Barbados has ever secured such a mandate. But of course, the mere fact that we have been given such an overwhelming majority should fill us with as much anxiety as it does elation, because the road ahead is going to be rocky, and Barbadians need to join with us as we seek to bring our country back to prosperity. It was a long campaign. Mr. Speaker, you've shared the reminiscences of many of the members of this chamber. In some corners, um, there was a total lack of charity and kindness on the political platform. Um, the campaign, in some corners, not ours, was characterized by venom, expletives, and total scandal-mongering. But we have to be thankful, sir, that the blood in the streets that was predicted to befall Barbadians during our last election and that came from what was then this side did not materialize. No doubt, sir, that the election process was one that was fraught with difficulty, but through it all the people spoke, and the people spoke with resounding voice. I reminded Mr. Speaker of that very old Latin maxim, vox populi vox dei, which loosely interpreted means that the voice of the people is the voice of God. There are some spectators though who said that, who, who've commented that crowds tend to get a little manic and that sometimes the voice of the people might be madness. I don't feel that skepticism about the majority that we've been able to secure in the last election. 
I think that our behavior since then, Mr. Speaker, as a party, as a ruling administration, would demonstrate to the people of Barbados that ours is not a party that is filled with hubris, or triumphalism, or gloating. Certainly for myself, in the hours after the election, I sought to hold out an olive branch to my opponents. Because first and foremost in my mind is the fact that the situation in our country is so desperate that all Barbadians have to work together. We are not fooling ourselves that we were elected to power by Barbados Labour Party votes alone. We were elected to power by people who would have gone out to political meetings, people who might have been Dems, people who might have supported the UPP, but regardless of their political stripes or hue, the message of the Barbados Labour Party successfully resonated within their bosoms and they have given us their support. And therefore, with that awesome victory, Mr. Speaker, comes an awesome responsibility. Because first and foremost, we must always remember that we are elected to represent all of Barbados and not the people who wear red. And Mr. Speaker, now the dust, the dust has settled and the combatants have retreated to their corners and the work of rebuilding Barbados has begun. And I must say that it has begun in, an, in a manner that, is, that can be described as nothing less than impressive. Mr. Speaker, I well remember what Barbados was like in the immediate aftermath of the 2008 election. Members of the Democratic Labour Party administration who were successful and who made their way into cabinet spent day after day, week after week, month after month trying to figure out who in the staff in their respective ministries were B's and who were D's and who should be fired and who should be hired, who should be awarded contracts, who should get a price stake off of their proverbial fatted calf. But while all of those things were going on, Barbados had begun to slip and to slide. There's that saying, sir, that Nero fiddled while Rome burned. Member for St. James Central is fond of using it, so I borrow it with, not, not with any attribution to you, but only because it is one of your favorites, sir. That Nero fiddled when Rome burned. And that has a double meaning, sir. It meant that Nero was playing music while his people suffered. You remember that Nero was the emperor of Rome. And so he was playing music while his people suffered. But the other meaning, sir, is that Rome had ineffectual leadership in the time of crisis. And when I reflect on both of those meanings, Mr. Speaker, I recognize that that particular saying very aptly describes the state of our country over the last 10 years. Because the Democratic Labour Party was interested in celebrating when they gave out a single house key. When they conveyed a house spot, they had massive tents and music and dancing and festivities for doing what the Barbados Labour Party always considered to be ordinary day-to-day -day work of government. And the most lavish fete that they had was a $7 million celebration of independence. And while that was a thing worthy of commendation and celebration even, we on our side cautioned that it was a mismatch of priorities. And for me, sir, at that time, my constituents had no water. And I could not in all conscience come to town and celebrate while my constituents were suffering. We've had 10 years of ineffectual leadership. A government that has put plan after plan, downgrade after downgrade, but the social compact 
that they had with Barbadians was disregarded and our society is not just in physical decay but decay in many other respects. But a new day which we promised has come and I believe that the Barbadian electorate, all of the people who have an interest in Barbados are standing by watching with some measure of respect the decisive way in which a Barbados Labour Party led by the Honourable Prime Minister Mia Motley has come to power and without pausing to celebrate and without pausing for festivities has sought to wrestle the problems of our country to the ground. That is what you can only describe as decisiveness. And at every step of the way over the last three amazing weeks, there has also been something that we didn't have for 10 years. We had a dialogue with our people, a, a communication with our people, taking Barbadians into our confidence so that they understood the difficulties that, were, that, that are confronting us. And these things, sir, for myself and for our team, I am able to commit to the people of Barbados that they will continue for as long as we serve the people of this nation. It is useful to take note of some of the ways in which we differ from the people who have preceded us. I often look at the Democratic Labour Party Manifesto of 2008, not for any inspiration, sir, but as a reminder of how not to do things. Because in 2008, the Democratic Labour Party promised to do <coughs> integrity legislation within 100 days. Promise after promise after promise after promise, none of which were kept. But we distinguish ourselves because in October of 2017, the then leader of the opposition said to Barbadians that at our first sitting of parliament, we will lay integrity legislation. Mr. Speaker, we didn't quite manage the first, but it was done on the second sitting of parliament. And it is integrity legislation that the leader of government business in the House will, I expect, notify members at the close of today's sitting that will be debated, at least in part, on Tuesday. And on that occasion too, Mr. Speaker, she promised, and by she I mean the Prime Minister, promised that she, that the government, our government, would abolish the NSRL and that bill was laid in Parliament yesterday, sir. And another draconian piece of legislation which so hobbled business activity in Barbados because it required you to produce a, a tax certificate from the Barbados Revenue Authority if you so much as wanted to blow your nose. The Prime Minister promised that that would be repealed in short order and Mr. Speaker, that bill too was laid in Parliament yesterday. I believe that the members of the Attorney General's chambers are probably beginning to worry that if we keep them at this pace, <laughs> that they might be inclined to mutiny. But the reality is, sir, that we recognize that we have commitments to keep and that Barbados has a day with destiny in very short order. And I apologize to my own staff in the AG's office if they're a little bit overworked, but they should take comfort in the fact that we too on the front bench are working as hard as, if not a little bit more than them. Mr. Speaker, <laughs> Mr. Speaker, um, I am pleased to offer my wrap up immediately after the member of St. Andrew, member for St. Andrew and I'm sure that five years from now um, he will have an opportunity to sing his swan song um, but 
in case I forget, in case I forget, on behalf of, of this entire chamber, I want to thank him for being a mentor to all of us. Uh, and um, I, I regret to tell you, sir, that we will not be celebrating his leaving us. Uh, we will be mourning it when that dreadful day comes. Now, Mr. Speaker, there are a few things that I think worthy of commendation. On Sunday, I had my motorcade, and a lady came up to me and she said, Mr. Marshall, tell me something. Are you all serious about giving back free university education? And you know, from the time we announced it, there were skeptics. The Democratic Labour Party poo-pooed it. Some of the literati in Barbados said it was an idle promise. Everything that you could possibly say negative about that commitment, that policy commitment, was thrown at us. But I was so happy to be able to say to that lady, because the reason she asked was because she has a daughter who has applied for university to go in in September. But she works in a supermarket in my Lord's Hill, in the vegetable section, and does not know how she, if she saved every penny that she worked for, she does not know how she would get her daughter to university. And sir, I think that standing here today, recognizing that we have made a sacrifice in some areas so as to be able to empower another generation of Barbadians is perhaps the noblest thing that a political party in this generation. But all of our efforts, all of our efforts may not have that import, but at every step of the way, they will bring about significant change in how we as Barbadians live. And for a long time, Mr. Speaker, we have grappled with this issue of how we deal with our sewage and our waste. And my constituency is one that is particularly affected by it because we still have a lot of, I don't want to say desolate areas, but areas where people don't live. And somehow or another, whenever somebody decides to dump something illegal, it makes its way into St. Thomas and St. Andrew and St. Joseph. And we are paying the price through the ruination of our environment simply because an administration did not take care to honor its commitment to the people. We are imposing, Mr. Speaker, a levy for the collection of refuse. But it need not have happened. Because the former Minister of Finance, Christopher Sinclair, imposed a levy at a rate of 2% on this country in the year 2016, I think it was. And he said then that it was for the purpose of purchasing garbage trucks. 2% in 2016. He came back to Parliament in 2017 having got the money for the levy but having also not purchased a single truck and he increased that dreaded NSRL to 10%. And he thought Barbians were so foolish because he offered the same reason that it was to buy the same trucks that he 2% should have bought. But no trucks have been bought, and a Barbados Labour Party administration, instead of being able to grapple with our critical issues, we now have to stop and say, so far and no further. And I know that I have some constituents who are concerned that this $1.50 a day being added to their water bill, they're, they're complaining. I've got many text messages and they're saying, but Mr. Marshall, we still having water problems. So how you want to carry my water bill? 
And I just want to take this opportunity to explain to them that it isn't that your water bill is being taken up, is being increased. It is that we have been forced to levy a dollar fifty per household per day. But the most effective mechanism for collecting it is to put the responsibility of collecting it on somebody that already has the capacity to do this. So we're not increasing your water bill by 40 or whatever dollars it is a month. What we are saying to you is that we want you to make a small contribution to allow the Sanitation Service Authority to get back to the mission that they have always had. We all know what a clean Barbados used to look like. I am ashamed, Mr. Speaker, to have people coming into Barbados as friends or relatives and to take them to parts of my constituency. Where, Mr. Speaker, there are areas as large as the distance between the mace and your, and your chair, sir, that are filled with garbage. Filled with garbage. And they're not in any back road, they're on the front. So this is what our guests are seeing. But what is worse, it is what we are seeing. It is what we are living with. It is what we are being pummeled with on a daily basis as the new face of what we used to describe as beautiful Barbados. We are changing every single one of those things, Mr. Speaker. We are grappling with the issue of the delivery of justice. The Prime Minister mentioned, Mr. Speaker, that there were 10,000 criminal cases. Um, I didn't want to worry her because I was worried that she would not want to give me the three judges that I asked for. Let me tell you, Mr. Speaker, citing from the report of the Judicial Council for the year 2015, which is, the, which is laid in Parliament, this is the last report to have been laid in Parliament by the Judicial Council. Mr. Speaker, in the Magistrates Court, in the year 2015, that is between the 1st of January 2015 and the 31st of December 2015, 365 days, sir, 52 weeks, 12 months. It, in the criminal and traffic division, so you would know that I'm not including domestic, civil, domestic violence, or juvenile. Those numbers are relatively small. But in only the criminal and traffic division, of the magistracy in Barbados, sir. A total of 21,729 cases were filed. Over a period of 365 days, 21,729 cases were filed in the magistrate's court. Mr. Speaker, we would have to make every single adult in Barbados a magistrate to be able to deal with the 21,729 filed in 2015. And I can assure you, sir, that a similar number was filed in 2014, and a similar number was filed in 2013. So we probably have, knocking around in the court system of the magistracy in Barbados, perhaps bizarrely as many, it could perhaps reach as many as 100,000 cases. That is what we've come to. And in the high court, sir, purely with the civil bench, and sir, no disrespect intended, but... <laughs> Uh, <laughs> you, your appearances in the civil court were, were they matched my appearances in the criminal court let's just leave it that way sir. but between the year 2011 and 2015 a five year period a total of 10,353 civil cases were filed 10,000 sir there is absolutely no way with our existing manpower 
that we could seriously boast about delivering justice to the people of Barbados when our courts, our court system is inundated with this volume of cases. It is impossible, sir. And three judges, which we desperately need, will only be the tip of the iceberg. Mr. Speaker, there are 954 what used to be called assize cases. They're not assize cases anymore, but you know that I mean criminal cases in the High Court. That are outstanding between 2003 and 2017, so 954. That's the extent of, of, of that backlog, and this only goes as far back as 2003. And what has been happening, Mr. Speaker, you know only too well. We have people on remand for capital offenses that the system must liberate and give bail to. Because three and four and sometimes five years perhaps pass, and a man or woman charged with murder has not yet got his or her day in court. I am pleased to say to this chamber that the DPP, as part of them joining in the effort to get rid of the backlog, has taken the decision to prioritize all capital trials. All capital trials. So it means that the assault will have to wait a little bit. It means that the burglary and the theft and all those other things will have to wait a little bit. But we cannot continue, sir, to have such a large number of murder cases sitting in our system without being treated with the priority that they deserve. And similar priority is going to be given to rapes and other sexual offenses because it is a disgrace that a country like Barbados would wait eight and nine years to do a rape trial or to do a trial where you have a sexual assault of a minor. It is wrong. It is wrong for the accused, but it is also wrong for the victim. So I have pledged to the DPP to give her department the resources that she needs so that we can also wrestle the issue of the delivery of criminal justice to the ground. But there are some hard decisions that are going to have to be made, and Barbadians, in the same way that we've been taking you into our confidence, I believe I have an obligation as Attorney General to carry on with that, sir. When you have perhaps as many as 100,000 cases in the Magistrates Court, you have to make a decision. You have to make a decision, sir. And we are rapidly approaching the point where we are going to have to simply say, let us forget some of these cases. In fact, let us forget many of them, sir. How many of you, as members of parliament, can reflect on situations where relatives and friends and neighbors were caught in a vicious combat? And they come to you and they, as they say in Barbados, they want to kill and cure. But two years down the line, somehow or another, the tempers don't flare so high anymore, and they make peace. They make peace. But you know what? When the tempers were flaring, the first people at the call were the people at District F or District E. And therefore, there's a court case in those courts waiting to be tried when the people have long since made up and are eating at the one on Sanders. And sometimes they have even passed into the great beyond. So we are going to have to use a surgical approach and simply say that the system can no longer carry this load and that we are fooling ourselves if we think that by holding on to 20 or 30 or 40,000 cases in the system that we are dispensing justice. All that we are doing, Mr. Speaker, you well know, is to be causing the wheels of justice to grind to a halt and then everybody suffers. So the people of our country will have to expect that in the coming months a system will be rolled out where thousands upon thousands upon thousands of those cases that have no hope of ever seeing the light of day 
will simply be taken out of the system. It is not the fault of the accused. It is not the fault of the victim. It is not even the fault of the lawyers. It is that we have a system that has become so overburdened that it can no longer carry its own weight. And to save the system, we have to be like a surgeon and cut away some of that baggage. And the same thing is going to happen with the assize cases. The same thing is going to have to happen. And the method that we are hoping to employ would see an element of restorative justice coming into play. And these are not new things. In the drug court, when an individual, a young man or woman in Barbados goes before our existing drug court, they have the option of pleading guilty at the outset, but no fine or penalty is imposed as long as they go through the system, or they go through the counseling first, and upon successful completion, no conviction is recorded. And I can see no good reason why we cannot take a similar approach for some of our cases in the High Court criminal jurisdiction. Where if one individual has injured another, should he or she agree to make restitution? Then it is open to the DPP to say, well, you all sort that out, I will make sure it's sorted out, and upon it being sorted out, I will discontinue the case against you. In an instance like that, sir, the victim can feel that he or she has received justice. The accused will recognize that he or she has been compelled to pay a penalty, but the society benefits without having to drag individuals through our court system. Mr. Speaker, we are not going to be able to throw money at everything, and I'm so happy that my colleague, the leader of government business in the House, was brave enough to remind our constituents of a simple truth, that if you keep doing what you're doing, you will keep getting what you always got. And that truth relates to the fact, Mr. Speaker, that already know that they're lining up at her constituency office saying, I'm looking for a job, I want this. It's happening already to all of our newer MPs. And, you know, we are elected to serve and to represent, and we all know that it is so hard to say, hold on. You can't get it just yet. But we do a disservice to our constituents when we hold out to them that the economy is standing on such strong legs that they can expect that they can get a job at the NHC around the corner or public works in another week or two. I too pray for the time when jobs will come. But if we keep doing what we've always done, we will keep getting what we always got. And I know that the economists among us are worried that we should take those approaches again. Mr. Speaker, as difficult a time as appears for our country on the horizon, I am gladdened and fortified by the voices of those people who are meeting us on the street and who are saying, we understand. And some are saying it could have been worse. And others are saying if we could endure 10 years of hardship on the Democratic Labour Party, we could handle a little bit more strain in the interest of saving the nation. And I believe that by expressing their confidence in us at the polls, the people of Barbados, in giving us this mandate, have said to us that we will walk this journey with you. It's not going to be easy, but I know, Mr. Speaker, that we will get it done in the interest of our people. In my final words, sir, I want to, at the request of the Minister of Finance, say to Barbadians who have already been asking that Within the next two weeks, the relevant amendments to the income tax and corporation tax structure will be put in place. So as to bring certainty, Mr. Speaker, to the budgetary announcements made 
by the Prime Minister. And I am also asked, sir, to indicate that the non-contributory non pensions will be paid from the 9th of July. Mr. Speaker, we are starting out a journey. And the member for St. Andrew knows that I tend not to display my softer side, the side that sometimes causes me to read poems. But there's a famous Barbadian poet, H.A. Vaughan, who many decades ago, Mr. Speaker, penned an absolutely brilliant poem called To the Unborn Leader. And with your indulgence, sir, I wish to share it with my colleagues, some of which, <laughs> some of which might actually be kindly disposed toward the Attorney General sharing a work of poetry to this chamber, sir. Um, H. A. Vaughan was a noted Barbadian scholar. And to the unborn leader, he said, sir, you who may come a hundred years after our troubled bones are dust, far-seeing statesmen born to lead and worthiest of the people's trust, turn these few pages in that hour when by dark doubts you are assailed, of what it boots to shape their power, read what we won and where we failed. And barb the word with wisdom fit, and build, oh build, where we but dream. Expose, undo, repair, extend, as you, oh master, best may deem. But whatsoever of ours you keep, whatever fades or disappears, above all else we send you this the flaming faith of these first years. I'm obliged to you. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move that the resolution read to this chamber on Monday by the Prime Minister do now pass.